Listener Production. Hello, happy Friday and welcome to The Briefing. I'm Sasha Barbagat. AI chatbots are becoming more human-like and now they can even recognise your emotions. Google and ChatGPT have both recently introduced new AI models that will be rolled out later this year and the race is on to find the best one. Humanising these AI models is very significant in the process. It's really exciting but also very risky. So what can we learn from this new phase of AI and what can it do for us? That's today's briefing. But first, let's get into the news headlines with Katrina Blowers. It's Friday the 17th of May. Hey, Sasha. Hi, everyone. Well, Peter Dutton wants to slash immigration and international student numbers if he becomes Prime Minister. So the opposition leader has now delivered his budget reply speech overnight in Parliament, saying the best way to ease the housing crisis and congestion is by further reducing migration. In an interview with the ABC, he rejected claims he was engaging in ugly politics. There are countless families I've spoken to mm. as I've gone around the country. I, every, think, I think it's the tone I'm talking about. Well, of every nationality, mm. uh, of people who have just arrived, people who are second, third generation from India or China, they can't find a house for their for their child, for their child who's in the workforce, working hard, paying taxes, but cannot for love nor money buy a house. Mm, Dutton has vowed to reduce annual permanent migration from 185,000 to 140,000 for two years before gradually increasing again over the following two years. And part of those cuts would include a reduction in humanitarian visas from 20,000 a year to just over 13,000. During his speech, Dutton also reaffirmed the coalition's commitment to nuclear power, but chose not to reveal details of this policy despite making a promise to do so in time for the budget. And Katrina, as well as what we've heard, Dutton also promised a two-year ban on foreign investors and temporary residents purchasing existing homes in Australia. You know, the government's acknowledged the challenge uh, that high immigration can bring to our housing market and other sectors of the economy. But yeah, I I do understand the, the criticism that it does kind of feel like a little bit of ugly politics. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that, you know, this is a populist reply straight out of, you know, a a traditional um, LMP playbook. The crackdown on migrants and law and order, um, uniform knife laws as well, which I think is something that broadly will be accepted. Um, The only problem is that, that the uniform knife laws are largely the responsibility of the states. And there's, you know, as you mentioned, no detail on nuclear power despite planning to cancel nearly $14 billion in tax breaks for the development of green hydrogen and critical minerals. I wonder when we are going to get those details on nuclear power. (laughs) But getting back to the claim that high immigration is to blame for the high cost of living, I mean, that is a bit of a controversial one. I think most of us know better to say that immigrants are stealing Aussie jobs, but definitely you can say, and and the government has said this, is too that the high rates of immigration are exacerbating pressure on housing, which is a key driver of inflation. But it is too simplistic to say that high immigration is to blame for high cost of living because, on the other hand, skilled immigration creates jobs and mm. economic growth. Um, I'm concerned too about these deeper cuts to international students. I kind of liked uh, Jim Chalmers' approach to this where he's put the onus, you know, not on these students taking away Aussie housing, but on the universities themselves saying, you know, if you want more international students who obviously pay more for their degrees, um, then you need to build the house. I liked that idea a bit better. I also want to point out that Australia's fertility rate is is well below the 2.1 that's needed to uh, sustain a population. And we do rely on immigration in a lot of ways to continue our population here in Australia, ticking away, making sure that, as you said, we have uh, skilled workers coming in and, and students studying. So, yeah, it feels like um, placating a certain section of the Australian community with this budget reply. 
The Australian Medical Association is seeking urgent meetings to find out who has been impacted by the recent cyber attack on MediSecure. Now, if you haven't heard of MediSecure before, it is a digital prescription company. And so far, they believe the data hack would include personal and health information of their customers. Not great. We don't know who the affected people could be, the specifics of the information leaked or how many people had their information compromised. Yeah, it is a big one and it is being taken seriously. The Australian Signals Directorate Cyber Security Centre, which uh, for those who don't know, it is one of our essentially secret services in this area, as well as the Australian Federal Police are investigating this breach. MediSecure has said in a statement they understand uh, the importance of transparency and they promise to provide further updates uh, as soon as more information becomes available there's concern especially with this around blackmail because it could potentially involve medical records and, you know, that's private information that a lot of people don't want anyone else to know and that's their right. And, of course, this isn't the first time we've seen this and it won't be the last. It seems to be the new normal in Australia and the government's really trying to play catch up on how to make sure that our information and our data is secure when everything, all our transactions are happening online. But I think if you're going to have the confidence to name your business MediSecure, you need to have the chops to back it up. So there's a big question mark over whether this name can go forward in good faith for customers in the future. Two pro-Palestinian university encampments are being ordered to dismantle their sites in Australia. So both Deakin University in Melbourne and the ANU in Canberra have now written to staff and students advising their position. Concerns have been raised about alleged threatening behaviour of students involved in the protests and the impact they have on Jewish students and the wider university community. This is becoming a real headache for a lot of university management to handle, Sasha. That's right. And it's really ramping up at Melbourne University's campus. So students, well, protesters there, there are concerns that non-students have actually infiltrated some of these camps and are are really ramping things up. But they've occupied a building on campus and the vice chancellor at Melbourne Uni has said they've crossed a line now. Uh, Police are involved. Uh, The uni confirmed uh, to the Herald Sun that they are engaging with police to see what they can do. Um, But yeah, it it does feel like it's ramping up in certain sections. It's worth noting uh, Sydney Uni, things appearing peaceful there. All reports say, uh, you know, the university has chosen not to move them on at this stage and, you know, it's business as usual, I suppose, for the encampment there. Uh, Look, I did actually have a student from uh, Deakin University in Melbourne reach out to me last night. Uh, They got in touch via email and uh, they said they're not part of the encampment, but they wanted to share kind of the feeling among students that they interact with. They're actually really angry that the uni has made the decision to shut down the encampment. Uh, I saw the email from the vice chancellor and, you know, it was talking about threatening behaviour and, and making people feel unsafe. This student told me that he's been going to classes as normal while the encampment's been set up over the last few weeks and he nor anyone, any of his friends have witnessed anything untoward. You know, that's one person's account. It doesn't say that that's Mm. the experience for everyone. I just found it interesting that someone who is at the uni who is not involved, you know, decided to speak out in support for the encampment. You know, we saw how ugly things got in the US. We don't want that to happen here. And, you know, we've had the discussion on the briefing before about universities and their place in protest, and it is an important one. So I think a lot of eyes are on what's happening there. Yeah, definitely. And thanks for reaching out. And we'd love to hear more of your voices. So you can get in touch with us via Instagram or email or, you know, however it suits. But yeah, we'd we'd love to hear more of, of those kinds of voices. And the Art Barney of the Year involving uh, Australia's richest woman. We've got an update on this for you. So artist Vincent Namajira has responded to the controversy surrounding his portrait of billionaire mining magnate Gina Reinhart. In response to reports that uh, Gina demanded the National Gallery in Canberra remove the painting of her, Namajira says... 
I paint the world as I see it, and he hopes people take the time to look and think, why has this Aboriginal bloke painted these powerful people? What is he trying to say? You know yes. what? That's actually what it did for me. I did sit there and think, what? what's with this eclectic group and why did he do it? And it, it actually made me read into it a little bit further. So, yeah, good on you, uh, Vincent. That's That's exactly what I did. Yeah, and that's the point of art, isn't it? It's supposed to encourage us to look deeper and think harder about things. Look, it has been revealed meantime a bunch of elite swimmers have started a campaign to have the portrait removed from this exhibition. Olympic gold medalist Carl Chalmers has confirmed that he and 20 others are campaigning the gallery on behalf of Gina Reinhardt and he's told the Sydney Morning Herald that she deserves to be praised and looked upon definitely a lot better than what the portrait has made her out to be. He went on to say without her sponsorship we would actually have nothing. So let's break that down because when I first read this headline I went why are swimmers protesting for Gina Reinhardt? So she was a patron of swimming. Australia until there was a bit of a funding dispute last year. She has donated, though, over $40 million to swimmers through her company's Hancock Prospecting Swimmer Support Scheme, which essentially helps pay their wages. So really interesting to see lobbying at work and how these rich and powerful people often get their way. However, uh, the National Gallery uh, has chosen not to respond to these reports. They haven't confirmed or denied whether Gina reached out to them. Uh, and they just say they hope people are, you know, having a think about what this conversation uh, can elicit. So um, I want to make the point as well with these portraits, because I've looked at them and I've looked at Gina's and there was Scott Morrison and Julia Gillard, Kathy Freeman, one of the guys from, from AC DC, Angus, I think. And they're all done in the same style. Like it's all a little bit cartoonish. It's all almost childlike. I wouldn't say any of the portraits are flattering. Gina has not been singled out here. No, no, definitely not. Um, Look, and she may not like it. And there's, you know, I was reading this great article today about other famous people in history who really hated their portraits. Like, for example, Winston Churchill hated his so much yes. that he demanded that it be burned. Um, <laughs> so look, I, I get it. You know, it, it's not flattering. I wouldn't want that out there of me, but it's art and art is meant to be about social commentary. It's meant to make you think it's not meant to be, um, um, largely, you know, a, an accurate reflection. I mean, go get a photograph taken, Gina, and, and pop that in the gallery. She could probably afford <laughs> to pay for that if she really wanted a nice flattering picture of herself. Yeah, maybe in response she should commission an artist to paint a really lovely, beautiful picture of her and they can hang it next door and then look at that beautiful art, beautiful, you know, social discussion about things. We love to see it. <laughs> Katrina, thanks so much for being here for the headlines. Hope you have a nice weekend. Next up, it is our deep dive into the revolution of AI and how it's starting to understand our emotions. Hi, Simon Beaton with you for this episode of The Briefing. What do you think when I say artificial intelligence? Do you leap straight to helpful apps like ChatGPT or are you immediately in the dystopian reality of machines taking over like iRobot, The Matrix. Well, according to experts, we're in the very early stages of an AI revolution that apparently is inevitable. Now OpenAI, the company that developed ChatGPT, have announced the next steps for their chatbot, with the app now able to respond to audio, vision and text in real time. This includes being able to recognise emotions and to interact more seamlessly with the user, ultimately making the app appear more human. And while these changes mean that the app is easier to use and arguably more helpful, what are the downfalls? What are the risks? Ashi Bat is a tech entrepreneur and she joins us now. So Ashi, looking at the evolution of AI, how significant are these new abilities such as emotional recognition? 
Yeah, sure. So this week we saw a bunch of new announcements with AI just from Google and OpenAI. So we saw the release of OpenAI's GPT-4 model and it's essentially designed to be this voice assistant that can understand real-time context and respond accordingly. But it also assumes really human-like expression and response times and similar with what you would have seen with Google and their Astra model, again, a voice model that can interact with you, understand your real-time context and up until this point, these big tech companies like Google and OpenAI have really focused on drawing a clear distinction between what's a chatbot, what's AI and what's human. And with this iteration, it really looks like they're blurring that line. And so, wow. yeah, and it's getting a lot more realistic. The conversations are going to get a lot, a lot more natural, intuitive. So really interested to see how that kind of evolves. Well, how important is that perceived emotional depth of AI in terms of impact for those, for people using it? Yeah, so humanizing these AI models is very significant in the process. It's really exciting, but also very risky. Like on one hand, we're looking at a future where these interactions and conversations and the way we use technology becomes a lot more integrated in our daily lives and a lot more natural and personalized and empathetic. But on the other hand, it's a lot riskier because, you know, even with the release of ChatGPT like 18 months ago, there has been an increase in scams and deep fakes and, you know, AI generated voice interactions are going to be that much more persuasive compared to some of that AI-generated text and images that you would have seen on the internet. Could AI then become dangerous in terms of manipulating people if it's that intelligent? Yeah, so absolutely. We're hearing reports of companies like OpenAI working with media agencies, talking about media partnerships and advertising and things like that. And so if these chatbots are then influencing us to take on certain views or adopt certain products, there's manipulation happening there that we might not even be aware of mm. and it might be influencing our behaviours and how we, you know, associate with certain brands. And so we actually need to become much more conscious of the inputs that we're putting in and the outputs that we're getting and really look at that with a critical lens going forward. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about the new Google AI assistant, which is Astra, yep. right? What's this? I'm assuming it's quite different to Hey Google. Yeah, so Google Astra, it's going to be available on your phone. They're rolling it out late this year, but essentially it allows a user to pick up their phone, scan their environment and ask context related questions and get a response in a human like behavior. It's got a female voice, very much more realistic than the previous phone apps like Siri that we've used in the past. So quite different from that. And they've also released a number of other AI updates like enhanced search and um, a video tool. So there were a lot of announcements of which one was Project Astra. So how will I use Google Astra in my day to day? Yeah, so the the model's only going to be rolled out much later this year. And at the moment, I think that is a question that a lot of people have, which is around like, what this, this is really exciting, it's entertaining, but what are the day-to-day -day use cases? And so one thing that we're seeing come out out of um, sort of Google demos is having this AI like help you plan your holiday itinerary or, um, you know, complete more holistic searches on the internet. All right. Yeah. So, so it is almost like, that next generation of, hey, Google, hey, Siri, but it's just going to be a hell of a lot more intelligent. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And so I think, you know, from a company perspective, I think leaders and things like that should be sitting down with these technologies, experimenting with them, understanding like strengths, limitations to really think about where these could plug in and play because um, there's huge opportunity there and you don't want to get left behind. So there seems to be quite a lot of competition almost between ChatGPT and Google and I'm sure that there's many other kind of AI companies that are in mm -hmm. that space. Is that competition really fueling growth in this sector? Yeah, definitely. In the last 18 months since ChatGPT was launched, we've seen so many announcements around AI. And I think this competition between these big tech companies, it's accelerating development. It's leading to more ambitious projects and timelines. It's increasing um, funding and research. And we can expect that to continue. Almost after this week, we're seeing companies like Apple and Amazon falling behind on that front. And I read that Apple is in talks with Google and OpenAI around licensing some of that technology for 
for right. their Siri model. And um, I'm excited to see how this evolves. And I think, you know, they're working towards a future where we do have these personal AI agents to help us across different aspects of our life, both professionally and personally. And I'm interested to see how that kind of unfolds. As a tech person in this space, how important is AI in the advancement of our global society? Are we actually in the middle of a new technological revolution right now? Or is this kind of small fish in what we'll see in the future with artificial intelligence? I think it is so significant. Like even in the last two years, the updates that we've seen, like with ChatGPT, for example, it basically democratized advanced AI and made it accessible to the average consumer and business owner and had all these applications across creativity, analytics, customer service. So I think where we're heading is really significant, just even in the form of having these personal AIs that really understand you, can anticipate your needs and help you solve problems and do things that you don't like doing, whether it's shopping for groceries online or even planning that holiday. So very significant in that sense. And yeah, I think the the growth and the development around this space is exponential. So you really need to keep your finger on the pulse because it's really changing very quickly. Yeah, definitely. I, even in the past 18 months, I yeah. guess, with chat GPT, is it moving too fast? In a sense, yes, because we're obviously seeing so many challenges around scams, deep fakes, hallucinations, and there is a fear that regulation isn't really able to keep up. And so as a user and consumer, we need a high level of discretion when we're dealing with these technologies and yeah, really taking that critical lens and asking you how you can protect yourself, just given that, yeah, there is that sort of ethical challenge um, and, you know, the, the possibility for bad actors to use it yeah. negatively, yeah. Do you think people can protect themselves from it right now? You know, there are ways to protect yourself from being scammed, for example. Like yeah. if you're, you know, limiting how much you share online or if you're double checking sort of scam messages and calls with the person they, you know, impact or, you know, double checking those sources, I think you can be a bit more sort of cautious. Isn't that like hard though? If Because we're, we're also coming off the back, it's still kind of ongoing with social media where there's kind of been this movement where we're told to share more and more about ourselves Mm. and what we're doing right now, we're speaking on a podcast, we're potentially giving our voice that could be cloned or and potentially scammed. Like, is it kind of too late to protect ourselves in, in that sort of manner? I mean, you know, we should have been asking these questions when social media was invented, but we didn't. And, you know, as we go go forward, we just have to have that level of discretion. We should be asking those questions because we don't really know how these technologies are going to evolve and what capabilities they're going to give people. We really can't see that far ahead yet. Where do you think this technology will lead us? The most realistic scenario is that we have these multiple models of AI that are have niche applications across different areas in our life, both personally and professionally, and can really understand us, you know, know our context, know what we need and do complete a series of actions for us. And then, you know, with these big companies like Google and OpenAI really pushing towards having more human AI, I think the idea for them is to have this much more integrated in our lives and push towards what they call sort of artificial general intelligence, which is having AI that mimics human knowledge, capability, learning and behavior. Wow. So it can actually help us in our day-to-day lives. And that's what they sort of call that vision. But we actually don't know how far we are from that. It sounds kind of scary, but also very exciting. Yeah, I think it's a very, like it's a double-edged sword. All right. So if I want to use AI more in my day-to-day, how do I get started? Where do I go? What do I do? Yeah. So as a first point of call, I'd actually sign up to some of these tools and have a play around with them, see where you can sort of automate aspects of your life or improve aspects of your life by asking them questions. But in terms of staying up to date with the latest, definitely, you know, follow knowledge sources like MIT Technology Review and Forbes and Fortune and all these outlets that are really um, commenting on these technologies and where they're going. And that's probably the best way to really immerse yourself in the literature around it, but also also follow some of the leaders in this space that are, you know, really operating in the future of AI. Thank you so much for joining us on The Briefing, Ashi. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. 
Ashy Bat, tech entrepreneur there. That's it for this episode. But before you go, we'd love it if you could share it with someone you think might enjoy it. If you want to keep up with our other content, you can check us out on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast and on TikTok and YouTube, search Listener Newsroom. I'm Simon Beaton. See you soon. Listener.